right. We are blessed to be joined by Luis De Silva Jr. Uh, Luis, you are a producer, author, actor, and former street ball legend. Luis, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. All right. So I, I got to ask the first question. As, as, as a kid who grew up in Jersey City, I got to ask the guy from Elizabeth, how do you get into cars? Right. I know. Tell me about it. Uh, I know I, there's there's many friends that we could probably share that still don't have uh, a, a, a license also. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, sports and cars, I think, work in tandem, especially in the city environments we grew up in. You kind of identify yourself with, with cars, uh, you know, growing up in the inner city. And it's uh, it's more of a, uh, a, a way of uh, expressing yourself. They're very similar to some of the basketball dribbling style I've done on the the court so you know life's part of expression especially growing up in the inner city and that kind of resonated into my later years and in hollywood you know you talk about basketball you made a name for yourself as tricks on the court uh, talk to us about walking into an open nike audition that you took where you were just a talented high school basketball player and all of a sudden coming out you're an international star yeah, you know, um, there was a uh, street ball, you know, during the N1 era, uh, a gentleman by the name of main event Wally Dixon, who was also a standout um, in New Jersey, went to Rutgers. He's from Linden. And I guess uh, throughout the years of him watching me in the street ball courts, he had calls and he was already a contractual N1 guy. I was like, hey, you know, I heard there's this Nike audition. I can't go, but, you know, go in there. Um, it's, you know, the Upper East Side and say Rupert sent you. And to this day, guys, I have no, no lie. Because I just did a podcast for main event himself. I still don't know who the hell this Rupert guy is. But <laughs> long and behold, long and behold, I just said Rupert sent me. Didn't have to sign in. I walk in and I'm in this high school gym, you know, this PS number, whatever, in New York City. They go by PS numbers. And uh, I'm sitting there. My dad came with me. I'm 18 years old. And there's streetball legends that I heard knew about, you know, the Pee Wee Kirklands and, you know, the um, Speedy Williams and all these other legends and Booger Smith and everybody who's a somebody who grew up in the streetball circuit and some NBA players having an open call and they give you a number and they give you like 30 seconds to do some demonstrations of what you could do with a fold-out chair. Some guys are dribbling, some guys are, you know, maybe dunking over the chair or just, you know, dancing, expression, because this is for an ad that later I realized this ad was, now I'm going to speak my age, was the launch of the Nike basketball domain. So now we're talking, you know, this is only 2001, but how fast, you know, the web era has developed in 22 years. So it was the launch of the Nike basketball.com. And I only knew that a couple of years after we did the Nike freestyle. So listen, I was nervous. I was 18 years old, sweaty palms. The room started to clear out as people were doing their demonstration. They put their coat on and all right, boys, I'll see you later. It was pretty much empty. I was the very last one. And I got on and I was just kind of duplicating everything I learned and been practicing in the backyard, which to me seemed normal because it's all, I was just trying to do creative new things. Well, one Jay-Z song came on and then there was another Jay-Z song. So they pretty much didn't tell me to stop and just kept rolling the camera. Um, and I was probably there for about five or six minutes going, running through like complete songs and still doing like basketball, dribbling and, you know, tricks that I've learned. And uh, um, I turned back around when I stopped and the room filled back up. Before you know it, everybody's walking to my dad thinking he's my agent. And what part of New York are you from? And they're like, no, we're from Jersey. And, you know, 20 some years ago before the Kyrie, there wasn't a lot of guys who could dribble like that from Jersey, let alone white. Right. So um, it was a big deal. And um, I was working a part-time job uh, an athlete's foot i think woodbridge mall the next day you know it was a cool day i was like man I, you know i think i did a good job but i didn't think nothing of it went back to my job my phone rings a job and uh they're like yeah we booked you for this commercial can you take and i hung up the phone thinking it's my friend called my job making a prank they called back and like did we have a you know interruption and this is like the work phone right nobody really had cell phones it's 2001 so um at least i didn't and um they're like yeah we uh we, we want you to come to astoria queens and shoot this ad so i'm like this is for real so uh, took the information down, you know, I wrote it down and went to my boss's office. It's like, yo, can I have this day off? I have to shoot. Uh, never forget this day because it's a day that kind of sticks with me. March 16, 2001 was the day that they were going to shoot this ad in Astoria, Queens. It's the day that kind of changed my life. So my boss is like, oh, no, we need you this day. So uh, I kind of told him I'm quitting. So I quit on the spot and um, get to the spot. You know, there's Paul Pierce. There's Shamika Hoseclaw. There's Aaron Davis. There's Jay 
Jason Williams, there's Vince Carter. I mean, all the guys that were the LeBrons of that time. Um, Lamar Odom. I mean, this is the Lamar Odom when he was, you know, Darius Miles. I mean, we're going back where this was, you know, these were the guys in the NBA at the time. And uh, man, they came to me and shook my hand and introduced me, themselves to me like I didn't already know who they were, but I guess they were in so awe what I was doing. And I was just an 18 year old kid, just uh, uh, happy if I got two seconds on camera. Well, you know, a uh, month later, the commercial comes out and I got a complete solo commercial to myself. So to this to this day, it's still out there. And, you know, I, I saw you post on Instagram this week, dribbled out my hood and landed on silver screen. Is it true right. that director Justin Lin and some other actors in the Fast series recognize you from your days as tricks on the court? Yes. Um, I mean, you guys are um, you guys did your research. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so don't, like, don't I, tell I, anyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I got to, so now, all right, fast forward, you know, I uh, signed a Nike endorsement deal, made the cover of Time Magazine of um, 2001. It was the best commercial of the year. So they gave me the cover of the magazine. We did a tour with Vince Carter. It was, you know, promoting this Nike basketball and then uh, landed on the, the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Guess I revenued Nike 300 and plus million dollars in 30 days and never suited up for an NBA game. So that was like a topic of discussion for quite some time. So that rolled into a multi-year endorsement deal and, you know, 18-year-old kid um, who NBA players and people in the street probably recognized more than some players at that time because street ball was, you know, NBA was kind of getting lost in the sauce for lack of better words. You know, this is after Michael Jordan and they're trying to find, and right before Kobe, trying to find that next star to really take this off. And, um, you know, Nike was struggling as well, not having that, that brand ambassador. So, um, you know, getting with the, the traveling with, with, with Nike and, you know, getting all the free gear and getting paid to do gigs was a dream come true. And I was like, okay, what's my next step? You know, I played professional show basketball with the Harlem Wizards and I worked out with the Harlem Globetrotters and they gave me a guaranteed contract. And I'm like, man, but my passion desire of entertaining in front of the camera was like, was cool. Like I was like a high, right? Like watching other people enjoy what I'm doing. So I kind of got a little bit more invested in taking the arts a little bit more seriously. In 2007, I got a break with um, Neil Jordan um, and we did the Brave one. I was the um, you know, Jodie Foster was the vigilante in the film and I was probably the protagonist um, and got pretty much like a co-star with Terrence Howard and became the number one in the box office. And then from there, it kind of translated into other projects until 2009 comes around and I see they're looking for a guy who speaks Portuguese and it's a Porsche driver for Fast and Furious. And at that point, Fast and Furious was, I think it was on Fast and Furious 3, shooting 4, and they were preparing for 5. So um, I called my ma- my agent at the time I was like, you know, I want to read for this. So I was living in Charlotte and uh, they're like, okay, so make your tape. So I called a buddy of mine who had a camera and he recorded me and I, I kind of reenact this scene where I thought in my head. And I got to tell you guys, the biggest movie was the easiest audition. They called me like an hour later and I booked it on tape. And um, two months later, I was filming in Atlanta and I walk in on set and it's so surreal, right? You're watching TV characters and the cars all staged in the tuner scene and just like, man, is this really happening? And Justin Lin comes running up. He's from Taiwan. And, you know, the, one of the Time magazines I was in the cover was for the Taiwanese Time for Students. So I spent a lot of time in Taipei. And, uh, you know, he was he was a fan of my work and introduced me to Vin. And that's how I got introduced to, to, to Paul Walker, God rest his soul, and everybody on the cast. And, you know, he was super excited because he's a, he's a real basketball junkie. So um, it's cool to know, you know, 12 years later, he wrote me in again in Diago and Fast 10. So it was, uh, it's really awesome. Awesome. It really is. It's like it's a like community, man. It's uh, if any time play a sport, especially being in the inner city or people who who love the game of basketball or any other sport, it's like a fraternity. You know, it's a brotherhood. Well, you know, we went fast and furious past your basketball career. You tried yeah. out for the Harlem Globetrotters. What was it yes. like trying out and, and being told that that you could be a Harlem Globetrotter? You know, it was it was it was surreal. I think it was fulfilling for me. Um, growing up, and I think you know, as a kid playing basketball during sixteen. 17, you know, NBA, everyone didn't want to play in the NBA, but I got to tell you, man, the, the N1 really had a lot of kids wanting to play N1 before the NBA. It was just a really, it was a hype. It really was. And and it took the world by storm. And I think Nike did a fabulous job paralleling that with the Nike freestyle. Um, so, you know, 
I knew that, you know, being a Harlem Globetrotter, it's like the godfathers of doing the tricks. And all I wanted to do, my vision was to, you know, kind of create different type of tricks that hasn't been seen before and kind of have my own identity in what I was doing. So going to the training camp in the Houston Rockets and working out with the guys and I had a great workout. Um, you know, one of those days you're making all your shots, trick, you know, we were playing real pickup and it's like I'm coming through the lane, you know, bouncing the ball off my head, off the glass, three guys come and try to block it. So it was like a, a real Jason Williams, so to speak, white chocolate showboat type of day, but everything was falling the way it needed to. So uh, I got a guaranteed contract. It was so fulfilling, but it's the bittersweet because um, I didn't take the contract. And the reason being is they wanted to own their likeness to my name, like they do with a lot of the talent that comes on board. And at that point, guys, I had too much vested and goals and, and, and things I wanted to do with, you know, my name. And if I did that, it would have been completely, um, the property would have been owned to the Harlem Globetrotter. So um, unfortunately, I had to kind of like walk away and, you know, tears for a couple of weeks. And I was concerned if I made the right decision. And, you know, thankfully I did, because if not, there wouldn't be in, you know, 80 plus films, um, you know, wow. 15, 20 years later. So, you know, it, it hurts, you know, at times. And sometimes I look back and be like, you know, just the what ifs, but things happen for a reason. And here we are. But, you know, there isn't a lot of people that can actually play real basketball in Hollywood. So I like to I always like to, you know, it's my, you know, you got they, you can win an Oscar, but I guarantee you I'll beat you one on one on a pickup. You so, seem to get <laughs> the best of all worlds. You get the movies, yeah, you get the basketball. Cool. And as a car guy in the last few weeks alone, you've been at the Indy 500 Formula One event and yeah. you were the fastest seat in sports at the Chevy Detroit Grand Prix. Yes. What's it like for a car guy to get that experience on the track there with those racers? You know, I got to tell you, it's, uh, you know, being being stapled as a car guy and seeing top speeds at 220 and being in a car going that fast on these turns and filling the G, you know, a G force or two. I got to tell you, it's a, it's, a, it's an exhilarating um, excitement, but it's scary. It's scary. And you'll know when it starts to, you know, you hear your heart, you know, you're, you're in a fire suit. All that sounds cool until you're putting it on. And then the ski mask comes on. And then once that ski mask comes on, that helmet follows and then everything becomes silent. And then it's just you, your heartbeat, the adrenaline, you know, they get you in this. And I'm talking about carbon fiber, your shoulder to shoulder, as tight as you come, you know, your knees up and they got this little hand grip where you're holding on where the steering wheel is. And, you know, it's all carbon fiber. So like they're, they're, and there's no room. They put the neck brace. I mean, it's like cost you. You're claustrophobic. It feels like, all right, guys, like you guys all been in New York City elevators, right? So like those elevators was like one or two people. And it's like the door closes at your nose like <laughs> that. And it's just like, you know, filling the top speed. You have to really like dig deep and say to myself, OK, it's either two things going to happen. I'm going to get, you know, claustrophobic and start to panic or you have to tune in and just really own this. Right. So like the mind has to really it's it's challenging because, you know, we're talking about fast speeds and adrenaline and excitement. But after I got out of that thing, you know, you got the, you know, the, the noodle legs, your palms are sweaty, your heart's pumping. But I'm an adrenaline junkie. And I was like, uh, I got to do this again. So um having the opportunity to do it in, in Detroit and to lead all the cars in the fastest seat in sport. You know, that first time was a little bit more uh, scary, uh, but in a good way, right? It was like exciting. And the second time I knew what to expect. But one thing I didn't expect, how bumpy the streets of Detroit are because we're running through the road streets and uh, potholes going that fast. And, you know, <laughs> there's no luxurious, there's no luxurious seats in those race cars, at least in the back of where I was at. And uh, listen, I'm 5'11", 160, so I'm not packing too much junk back there. My little tail was bouncing up and down. It was painful but fun. You know, and, and so now you're going to be hanging this weekend with some of the legends of 24 Hours of Mons. Those guys sit in the car for hours and hours and yeah. hours racing around and having to do that. What's it like for you now to be the Grand Marshal of the 6th Annual Philadelphia Concours de Elegance and to hang with, with not only those legends of racing, but somebody like Dick Vermeer? Well, you know, it's... um. Funny you said that because, uh, you know, at Indy, I got a chance to meet, you know, a good buddy of mine, Adam Driver, again, worked on the project. And he's from Indiana and he was a grand marshal in Indianapolis 500 this past year. So I was like, man, wouldn't that be cool if they do something like in my home city where I'm at and do something there? I was like, yeah, you never know. So it was like a thought. And after that, it was just like, you know, moved on with the day. Well, long and behold, you know, three and a half weeks later, um, able to become a grand marshal at this awesome event. Not to mention, you know, it's, uh, it's hosted by the 75th anniversary and 
Porsches, their, their car, and you know my you know, history with Porsche on these blockbusters. I'm the only character from the franchise that has the same car besides you know Dominic Toretto in two separate installments. So um, you know it's really owning in for the whole Porsche thing, and uh, I'm digging it. I'm excited. I don't know. Uh, I have an idea what to expect because um, I don't know if you guys ever been to Indy 500 or heard about it, but there's that basement that no one goes into. Your phone's got to be in your pocket, and it's like the very first car ever ever made. You know, every championship car. You know, uh, from the Mario Andretti's on. I mean, it's just like it's a museum. So now being able to enjoy in these festivities with you know the cars for kids and chop and the museum and then seeing some of the legends i mean i I, there's real conversations to have right i was on three laps what is that six minutes and i was in a panic let alone 24 hours and so and that's that's the next thing i want to do not actually racing but engaging and like being in one of those locations where the cars are passing through um the le mans that's awesome you know we have been lucky to to be a part of this the last couple years and, and you're gonna love what you get to see in terms of the classic cars but the thing that's great about it is what it goes for and you've got a close connection to chop with your eight-year-old daughter can you talk about what it means not only to support the cars but to support cool cars for kids and chop and and the work that they do here in the community well yeah i mean you know um when this was presented to me they said you know children's hospital of philadelphia and i my wife's a, uh, a nurse um and her mom's you know a director of nurses so the name shop comes up a lot and and i know their you know lineage and and what they stand for and how reputable they are not only in the region but in the nation right so um you know i have a eight-year-old daughter and i have a six-month-year-old son who literally just went for his checkup today children's hospital of philadelphia but just a pediatrics division and guys you know if you're in you know marlton or Voorhees or anywhere in south jersey or outside the surrounding philadelphia how highly dense and populate it with CHOP. And I love, you know, what they're doing for, you know, the, the kids that are, are not as privileged. Um, and and, and there's, a, there's a lot of them that are just, you know, and families have to deal with, you know, these, these, these circumstances and, and it's a change of life. And, you know, um, Cars for Kids, I think that's a cool slogan. I think it's awesome. And um, this was brought to me new and I want to completely continue on adding on to this because, you know, listen, um, we're fortunate. We wake up every day healthy and um uh, i feel like it's our duty to inspire and help you know put smiles in everybody else's faces um especially kids you know kids are pure kids are are you know i'm i'm a spiritual guy so you know i, I don't want to get into a whole religion thing here but i'm roman catholic and i'm i'm a practicing catholic so it's uh, it's important to do things like this that have meaning and i want to continue and do so i support it a lot with saint jude and now being in philadelphia and knowing that they have these cool events here uh clearly it's going to be something I'm going to continue on engaging and um, put my support and effort in any way I can, you know, Um, as we get older in life, you know, you know, you start to say to yourself the fulfillment of having cars, you know, I've had the plethora of them and it's fun when you get them out of the lot and it's exciting, but that's still that spark and joy of when I, you know, when I buy somebody a car, when I buy my mom a car, when I buy my sister a car, you know, I'm doing something to help someone else. You know, it's uh, it's that Christmas joy tickle in your gut feeling uh, that's way more fulfilling than my own personal needs and desires. And I just that's where I am in life right now. I just feel like, you know, the the, the joy and fulfillment of, you know, to helping others is way more fulfilling than self so, you know, normally we'd ask somebody like you, what's there left to do for a guy who's a street ball legend, had the career that you had in that that realm, all of a sudden becomes a big star. You're in one of the biggest movies in Hollywood this year. And I would ask you normally what's next, but you're also an author. Like, mm. so of, of all the stuff that you've done, how do you get into being an author of children's books? Well, you know, I guess, uh, I, I guess the inspiration was, of course, being a father um, and when I knew I was having my daughter, I, you know, I spent a lot of time in the air flying and I used that as a motivation to try to try to create, try to do something that's fun. You know, um, um, you know, uh, I, I uh, spent a lot of time writing. I think most of my writing comes from when I'm taking these long travel trips and it was more of a hobby and having fun with it. And um, I'm owning it. It's uh, it's exciting. Um, you know, I, I would I would use that loosely. I think some authors spend a lot more time in their writing 
lately I haven't had the time to spend much time, but there's a, there's always a lot of things you can do next. I think, you know, um, preparing, trying to write again and, uh, continuing these book series for children. And, um, I think this weekend will be an optimum time to, you know, collaborate with, you know, cars for kids and, you know, express my desire to, you know, offer these to, you know, chop, et cetera. I think, you know, the world of expectation and what we can try to achieve collectively um, for the community is endless. And especially in Philadelphia, man, in the surrounding areas, I think this is a city that definitely needs it. You know, we, it has the title of, you know, the city of brotherly love and brotherhood, but you know, there's like many other inner cities, it, it, it has its own struggles. And um, I think there need to be more positive um, influencers that are still active in the city. And when I say that, I say that loosely. You know, I know there's a ton of celebrities that come are from Philadelphia, but really don't remain in the area. You know, so I would like to be somebody who's a little bit more vocal because I call Philadelphia home now. Right. So this is, this is my home. So, um, and be a lot more vocal and doing things in the community and, you know, on the, on a grassroots level. And I think that would build the community and make this place a better place day by day. And that's all we can ask for. All right, Lu- Luis, before we let you go and see you this weekend, one more question that people want to know, did you get to pick so your you car? For- huh? So Jess, you guys will be there. Yay. All right. Jess. So, so, so here's the question. Did you get to pick your car? For, for, for a Fast and the Furious. <laughs> so I get to one and, uh, you know, it's an eight-hour flight. I left Voorhees, right? Car picked me up at my house. I'm headed to the airport and, you know, direct flight to London. And I'm saying to myself the whole flight, now just what if, what if my next car is a Porsche again? And right away, my mind's like, man, there's no way. I shouldn't be the ambassador for Porsche. I mean, this will kind of like, I would think this will put me in conversations <laughs> to solidify it. So I'm having, Always these thinking. Internal, <laughs> yeah, I'm like having these internal conversations. Like it wouldn't be far fetched and I'm getting there. So I don't know what car is there. It's not written in the original script. So I'm like, what car is it? Sure enough, long and behold, I get to my trailer, my door knocked. It's Vin Diesel. Hey buddy, glad to have you here. You know, we brought you back. You know, I I was fighting with Universal. I told them we need you in this scene because the the best tuner scene in the franchise was the one from Fast Five. You're a fan favorite and you bring a different type of flair and energy. And I need this. This is like a trailer moment. And you keep repeating the trailer moment. But I'm like, you know, Vin Diesel's blowing wind. He says it to everybody, but he really was on all the trailers. I was a part of the trailers. Like, I need you to bring me something that's a trailer moment. I'm I'm really want to use your scene for a trailer. I mean, this freaking thing was on. Super Bowl. It was on, you know, the NBA playoffs, the finals. I mean, if you go right now on Instagram and you tap Fast X, I mean, there's a plethora. I mean, they've spent at least $150 million in marketing. So he wasn't lying. I guess he had him and Universal knew exactly where they were going with this. But I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all cool. It was like, can you take me to the car? So we walk and this is like, you know, before the sets there. Sure enough, Lizard Green 997 GT3. And I'm like, and I'm saying, keys like this is uh everything i said in my mind is happening like blue porsche green porsche there has to be something we do it's it's amazing how that worked out for you we're so thrilled for the success that you've had uh can't wait for jeff to see you. i'm gonna try and get there saturday jeff will make sure to see you there and we, we hope we get to talk to you more as as you continue to go forward and, and have great success no, listen whatever. guys you guys are you guys are awesome you i love what you guys are doing and you're, you guys are local and whatever you guys need from me and thank you for Richard, what you're doing for the culture and cars and you know i think you know i want to end it on this note i think it's very important especially for you know the gen z's right you know no one really wants to drive and you know i just feel cars are you know cars are cool cars there's 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 it's, it's part of america it really is i mean it's part of our culture it's part of our heritage and i would like to see the younger generation and that's what i'm thriving or getting the younger generation to, you know, be the enthusiast and keep this alive, you know? And I think I think our franchise with Fast and Furious did a did a relatively good job in and and building the culture of cars because car shows were really became prominent since the franchise has been in existence since two thousand and one. I mean, you can look at any city and every weekend and there's a car show going somewhere and it wasn't the narrative 30 years ago. So, you know, I love it. And I just wanted to see it continue on growing and I well, we'll, uh, look forward to see you guys this weekend. We'll keep the conversation going. Can't wait to have you join us again for it. Thanks so much for the time, man. Thanks, guys.